Very good. Well, good Thank evening, you. everybody. Good evening. And first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Father Fergus O'Connor, parish priest of the Lady Queen of Peace Parish in Ballsbridge here in Dublin. And you're very welcome to our webinar on St. Josemaria today, his feast day. He died on this day in 1975 and was canonized in 2002. And I had the good fortune to have been present in St. Peter's Square at both his beatification and canonization. And I'm very happy that Father Paul O'Callaghan has been able to accept your invitation and has very kindly agreed to help us celebrate today by reflecting on the topic, is Christ present in our society in the light of St. Josemaria's teachings? Father Paul, some of you may know, is from Goatstown in Dublin, and he has a master's degree in electronic engineering from University College Dublin, and a license and doctorate in theology from the University of Navarre. He was ordained a priest of the Prelature of Opus Dei by Pope St. John Paul in 1982. Since 1990, he's been teaching theology in the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, Santa Croce in Rome, and is currently director of the Department of Dogmatic Theology and also a professor of theological anthropology. And also a fellow of the Pontifical Academy of Theology. So we have a very well qualified lecturer with us tonight. At the end, Father Paul may have some time to answer questions that may arise. So if you'd like to type them into the chat feature or the Q&A feature, we'll just see how that goes. And so without any further ado, I'll just hand you over now to Father Paul. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much for the kind words and the uh, invitation uh, you've given me to talk about uh, the, the topic, is Christ present in our society? Christ present in our society. Uh, and I suppose we could say yes and no. Huh? Yes and no. Uh, I mean, Christ will never be fully present in our society until uh, the end of time. I, mean, I suppose that will be the end of time. And then uh, God will be, as St. Paul says, all in all things. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, no? Uh, God will be all in all things. Only at the end of time will things be fully straightened out and uh, everything in its place as it should have been. Um, and at the moment, I suppose, we, we do what we can. And, and as Christians, we take that in our stride. We take the fact that the church is a pilgrim church. We're on earth and we're on a pilgrimage to something greater, more wonderful, more beautiful. We're aware, of course, of the no, that, that, that Christ isn't present in our society and many things. We're aware of that. Maybe we, we think about it too much. We analyze it too much. And we should be aware of the ways in which Christ is present in society and in kind of strange ways that uh, people can point out to us. For example, when people insist on the importance of the distinction between church and state, we should remember that that is a Christian contribution, as a Christian idea. No religion has ever sort of systematically divorced itself or separated itself from uh, the state and the organization of the state. In fact, most religions are the state and religion and uh, the country and culture, everything is totally tied up. Eh? And whereas in Christianity, that's not the case. And it wasn't the case at the beginning when Christianity began. And throughout history, there have been moments when Christianity has become sort of the, 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 sort of the, 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 the religion of Europe, for example, or whatever other part of the world or of America. But that's not necessarily the case, and it doesn't have to be the case. Another point that we might notice at times is when people speak of universalism, uh, that we are all the human beings that were of the same nature, uh, that were equal to one another. Uh, the, the, the very strong reactions have been in recent months and years in the area of racism. I mean, it's very, a very typically a Christian uh, way of uh, focusing things. There are very few cultures have originally that idea that all people are equal. In fact, Christianity was the, is really the only religion that has made this a, a, a major issue, that we're all of the same nature. Another point that I'd mentioned there where uh, we come across things which are deeply Christian and we should recognize them as such and take satisfaction in the fact that they're there is 
uh, the question of the, the, the value and the sense of compassion. Some of you may have read and may have come across the book of Tom Holland called Dominion. And he explains a kind of a history of the world, the history of Christianity, but he explains that the idea of compassion, of understanding people for one another um, in different, many different ways uh, is something that comes from Christianity. And when we invoke it and when we speak about it, that we should take other people uh, into account and we should be uh, understanding towards them and all that kind of thing, we're talking about something that's Christian because many, many peoples they looked after their own friends and they looked after their own family and their own town or whatever it was, but that was it. Right? That was it. After that, it was sort of, uh, you, 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 you just, you go for the other fella. You don't just get rid of the other peoples. And that wasn't the idea of a, of a sort of a universal compassion of all human beings. That's not a, that's not a, a, a an idea that just sort of uh, is common uh, inheritance. It's not people's uh, common idea. No? Now, uh, that book, I'm, some of you may have read it, uh, and I think it's a very interesting read. It makes a very interesting read. It's a book of religious sociology uh, that uh, recognizes this fact. But there's a defect in that book, huh? which is, uh, uh, since it's a book of religious sociology, it's, it's attempting to describe history and sociology. I mean, it, it carries out its task very well. But the fact is, the question has to be asked, how did this transformation of people's mindset actually take place? How did it happen? How did this culture get established? As if it was obvious, as if people could just take it for granted. In fact, the author in question says he claims to be an atheist. Um, so therefore, for him, Christianity is just, uh, it's just a, a, a thought system uh, that, that works and that has been very successful and has done enormous good to the world. But basically, you could say it's a form of gnosis. Christianity is just a form. It's a Gnostic system. It's a, a system that we really know the way things go and the way things uh, work. And I think we have to recognize, and this is the main point I want to make this evening uh, in this talk, that this spirit which we live off and we're grateful for, and we have to promote and maintain because we could lose it, the spirit of compassion, of understanding for other people, closeness to other people, and all that kind of thing, I suppose the spirit of the good Samaritan or whatever you want to call it, um, it, derives, it derives from God's intervention in our history. Salvation. Christianity isn't just a thought system. It does obviously has a, have a dogma and does have a series of, uh, of intellectual elements, but it's salvation. It's grace, it's incarnation, it's God who comes to us. St. Paul speaks of the power of the gospel, the power of the gospel. Um, as Christians, we speak of the infused virtue of charity. Charity isn't just that I decide to love people. Uh, it's, not, it's not that easy. Um, but for, to, to be able to love people in an adequate way, in a sufficient way, we need the infused power of God, the grace of God in our souls. And that's the way in which we can love people truly, uh, forgive them deeply. In other words, the reality of Christianity is a divine energy okay, that we're invited, obviously, to accept and to assimilate and to live within and we don't always manage to do so, but the initiative is entirely that of God's. God is the one who set the ball rolling, who got things going. Now, as our father saw uh, the work developing in the earliest times, and as he remembered those key dates of 2nd of October, 14th of November, uh, 1928, 1930, etc., um, uh, what he called Opus Dei was very significant. He called it Opus Dei. Eh? He called it the work of God. Operatio Deo, God's own work. Uh, and that's why as Christians, and uh, certainly St. Jose Maria had that idea, we have to live with a supernatural outlook. Now, uh, to, to, uh, to have a supernatural outlook, it's not a question of sort of mental acrobatics, which bring us to think, well, you know, things are really bad, but in fact, they're really good. No, it's not that. Eh? That doesn't make sense. We have a supernatural outlook because we know that the one who's keeping the show on the road is the Lord. He's the one who's pushing. He's the one who's giving grace. He's the one who's inspiring. He's the one who's accompanying. He's the one who's provident. He's the one who's bringing us along all the time. 
obviously we resist that. Eh? We resist that because we're sinners and we're born sinners. Uh, we resist God's efforts and God doesn't want to force us. God doesn't want to deny our, our free will and our own inclinations. But uh, the fact is that the power of the gospel, that is the real Christian power, and it is a power. Hmm? Uh, you might have come across the book of Rodney Stark, uh, The Victory of Reason, very beautiful book, uh, speaking of the, the history of Christianity again. And he's another one of these authors, sociologists, who, who says that, um, that he's an atheist. I don't know why these atheists kind of say things that are fairly, uh, fairly interesting. And he studied uh, the growth, among other things, the growth of Christianity in the first three centuries. With Constantine, things changed a little bit, but anyway, I, won't, I don't want to get into that. But in the first three centuries, basically, Christians were nobodies. They were nobodies. From the, the social uh, standpoint, from the economic standpoint, from the military standpoint, from uh, just from the point of view of social influence in society. Christians were nobodies. Eh? They were basically you know, very ordinary people, and they just did whatever they could. Whatever they were able to do, they did. And in, in those years, without any violence, without any threats, without any economic advantage, uh, Christianity grew. Why was that? Because of the power of the gospel, eh? and especially uh, the power of Christian charity. He explains it very well, that the reasons why Christians, people became Christians was because they saw that Christians loved one another and looked after one another, and especially they looked after the weaker members of society. And that's the way Christianity grew, in a society which was deeply hostile, in a society which demanded of people that they bow the knee to the emperor or whatever god was there uh, to be dealt with or to be looked after. Um, now, that's the, the, the situation that's to sort of situate this topic, because I wanted to talk about a particular homily of uh, our fathers, uh, written, or at least published in, uh, uh, pronounced, uh, the, the homily was pronounced in 1967, on Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord, uh, Christ's presence in Christians, in uh, Christ is passing by, huh? And I'd recommend you to read that homily because it is very powerful and it, the message of it is very, very clear. Uh, it's, a, it's a real reminder of a message which is deeply uh, rooted in St. Paul. You might remember the phrase Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. Christ lives in me, works in me, acts in me. Uh, talks through me. And that is the identity of a Christian. That's not just a description of St. Paul's own life. That's a description of the life of any person who strives to live a Christian life. So that's what Christians are. Christ is present in them. Christ passes by in and through them. And that's what the whole homily uh, is about. I suppose we could say as Christians, to paraphrase, the, the, to, 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 to cite the, the, the major work of, uh, of, um, of cinema uh, art, uh, the, the Blues Brothers, you could say, we're on a mission from God. Right? We're on a mission from God, because God is the one who is actually there in us and working through us. So just to have a look at this uh, homily, just to say a few things about it. Uh, Christ is alive. Eh? Our father starts off with this idea. Uh, Christ is alive. And that's the reason why, as Christians, we can overcome all obstacles, especially the obstacles of death, of sorrow and anguish, of all kinds of obstacles that could arise. No? Now, uh, I'd mentioned this in, um, in five parts, eh? in five parts. Uh, five sections which he de uh, deals with. In fact, I'll put on the chat screen if I can, um, if I can put a, 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 a thing to all the uh, people who are. I notice I can't, uh, I can't actually put the thing, but I'll put in all attendees. Okay. Now yeah, I put yeah. in the I put in a connection uh, to uh, the file of an article I wrote on this uh, on this. Um, 
uh, topic uh, some years ago. Right? So I'll be following the elements of this article. Have you seen, can you see it there? Can you see the- uh, Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Mr. Walton, okay. I'll, I'll switch it to everybody, okay? Yeah, pass it on to, uh, pass it on to other people if okay. you can. So uh, what are the points? There are five points here, uh, five elements that St. Josemaria uh, mentions. The first element is that uh, the, the Christ is present because Christ is present. Eh? Christ himself is present because Christ is God's made man, and therefore he's present among everybody who lives on the earth. Christ is still alive. No? And he, he, he says, you know, he's not someone who has gone, someone who existed for a time and then passed on, leaving a wonderful example and a great memory. I mean, that's the way a lot of people look on Christ, uh, but that's not the case. No, Christ is alive. Christ is the Emmanuel. Christ is God who is with us. God hasn't abandoned us. Christ, uh, God is still with us. Then the second point he mentions is uh, that Christ is alive in the church, in the, tr in the church and through the church, in its sacraments, in its liturgy, in its preaching, in all that it does. No? Interesting there is complete the, the sacraments, the liturgy, the preaching, and all that the church does. Eh? And we should remember that the church is the body of Christ and therefore is acting and is still present in spite of the limitations of human beings that go to make up the church, all of us. Uh, and especially in a special way, he says that that is the case uh, with respect to the Blessed Eucharist. The Eucharist is the, the strongest, most powerful presence of God in the world. Then the third point, and this is the key one, this is the key element that I wanted to uh, uh, speak about, is that Christ is present in Christians. Christ is present in Christians because we have been divinized by grace. We've been made divine by grace. We've been filled with the life of God. And that necessarily affects everything that's human. In fact, the words I mentioned earlier on Galatians 2.20, uh, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. Uh, that's a topic which um, that's a, a citation that uh, St. Jose Maria mentions in this particular uh, connection. Christ is the one who is present in me. You know? um, now, there are many uh, manifestations uh, of this presence. And one of the points which we all remember in our father is that even though the world goes ahead and there are changes in science and there are changes in our understanding of the world as progress and development of all kinds, he still says that in the religious sphere, man is still man and God is still God. In this sphere, the peak of progress has already been reached. Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. <clears throat> At the spiritual level, no new era is to come. Everything is already there in Christ who died and rose again. But we have to join him through faith letting his life show forth in ours to such an extent that each Christian is not simply alter Christus, another Christ, but ipse Christus, Christ himself. So what our father is basically saying here, what St. Rosemarie is saying, is that we live in a society, a lot of things come and go, a lot of things change, but the basics are always the same. The basics are always the same, which is Jesus Christ, our creator, our Lord, and our savior, who died and rose again from the dead, who is present in his church, uh, to whom we have to be united in faith. So that's why I suppose you could say the two poles of Christian life are Christ and faith. That's what we have to make sure that we're looking after. And if those two are looked after, all the other things, and some can come and go, eh? all the other things can come and go in God's good time. But then our father makes this uh, mention here, this, uh, this, very, this very interesting uh, pair of expressions that he, that he brings up, which is that we are, uh, Christians are alter Christus and ipse Christus. Now, the expression alter Christus is quite common. It's quite commonly used down throughout history. Yeah? Um, alter Christus means another Christ. And it's often been applied to the priest. It's often been applied to Christians in different connections. It's quite a common expression. But our father goes further than that because Alter Christus could be somebody who lives like Christ, who has the virtues or at least some of the virtues of Christ, somebody who tries to imitate the, the life of Christ. And you could even imagine somebody who isn't a Christian could be in a situation like that. Eh? 
um, a person who can, tries to imitate the life of Christ, Mahatma Gandhi or whoever it is, many people have attempted to do that and do it perhaps without even realizing it. But our father went further than that. And he said, no, Christians aren't only another Christ, like somebody who reminds you or sort of who represents the life of Christ. No, we are ipse Christus. Christ himself. And as far as I know, nobody has ever used that expression in the strong, forceful way in which our father used it. In other words, that Christians, uh, as we walk down the street, we realize I'm a son and daughter of God, son or daughter of God, uh, and Christ lives and works and acts and speaks in and through me. Uh, in spite of all kinds of limitations that are there. And we should be aware of that. We should be very conscious of that. Eh? It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now, uh, one of the points that he makes in the, uh, in the homily or in the, the, the meditation is in Christ is passing by, and I think it's fascinating. I think it's a very good point to keep in mind, eh? uh, which is that Christ's presence and effectiveness is not severely prejudiced or damaged by our imperfections or sins. You know, sometimes we feel that, well, if we do things badly or if we don't behave or whatever the thing is, uh, well, then we're going to ruin the work of Christ. No, no, we're not. And we can't even attribute to ourselves something as unglorious as that. No? We can't become, as Christians, we can never become infamous because even the worst of our actions cannot damage the cause of Christ and the cause of salvation. I mean, they can damage, they can slow it up uh, like a break, you know? but, but uh, it's not really damaging. Our father said, this happens not so much in spite of our wretchedness, but in some ways through it, that's a very daring expression of our fathers. Not so much in spite of our wretchedness, but in some ways through it, through our life as men of flesh and blood and dust, Christ is shown forth in our effort to be better, to have a, a love which wants to be pure, to overcome our selfishness, to give ourselves fully to others, to, uh, to give our existence, to turn our existence into a continuous uh, act of service. With all our personal defects and limitations, we are other Christs, Christ himself. No? Uh, so I think that's a good thing to, uh, to keep in mind, just to remember that, uh, that idea that uh, the power of Christ working in us and through us is not necessarily damaged by our, the poverty of our action, because I'd say for, for two reasons. First of all, because the power of God is the power of God. God acts in, in us and through us in many different ways. But also people can say to themselves, oh, yes, well, of course, that reminds me when I see this person's defect. Uh, it reminds me that uh, I'm not following that person, but I'm supposed to be following Christ. I remember uh, I've told it many times, but I've always found it very amusing going down, um, down beside the, the Keys in Dublin early in the morning down to Lismullen for mass. And there was a fellow in front of me driving his car and he had a sign on the back of the car. And I did what I shouldn't do, which is kind of go up to see what the sign said. And it said uh, on the back of the car, don't follow me, follow Jesus. No? So he turned to the right and I went straight ahead. That's where I had to go. Um, don't follow me, follow Jesus. And I, I think there's a lot in that. You know? We have to remind people that they're not following us, they're following Jesus. Therefore, even the things that we can sometimes do a little bit badly, they're not going to affect things. Besides, and our father says that, it can be seen in our effort to be better. Because people can see that maybe we don't do things perfectly, but we're trying to do them perfectly. So people can identify with that. Huh? Everybody knows that they have to struggle. So if they see that a Christian does everything perfectly, they'll be discouraged. If they see that a Christian like them uh, is struggling as well, every so often they don't manage to do things uh, perfectly, they'll feel encouraged and they'll be able to do things uh, better and better as time goes by. Anyway, that for me is the central point that I wanted to take out of the, the writing of our father. Another point that he mentioned, the fourth one, was that uh, in order to do that, in order to be like Christ and have Christ who lives within us, uh, we need to identify ourselves with him and especially contemplate his life and his love for us contemplate the gospel, contemplate the things that our Lord did for us. And especially in that homily, there's a very beautiful meditation 
on the disciples on the way to Emmaus and how they learned from Jesus to focus things in a new way, in a different way. And I think we have to be very aware of that as, as we read the gospel, you know, that Jesus is actually trying to teach us new things. He's trying to give us new ideas. We're trying to get a new angle on things. You know? And then the last point that um, our father uh, mentioned in that homily, the fifth area is, uh, he mentions that uh, Christ lives in us especially through the virtue of charity, especially the virtue of charity. And the idea comes up there that charity isn't just, again, it's not just sort of doing something purely human. It's not a purely human thing. It's realizing that we're meant to be icons of God's grace for other people. So it's not just a question of being kind and affectionate and maybe drawing attention to ourselves in such a way that people say, oh, he's a wonderful person. This is a marvelous person. All the wonderful things that he does, no? And at your funeral, they're saying all kinds of nice things about you and that sort of silly stuff, you know? Yeah, who believes it anyway, no? Um, rather, what the grace of God does and the, 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 um, the gift of charity gives us is a capacitation to love God on God's behalf in a divine way. In other words, God loves other people. Christ loves other people, people in us and through us. And that's why, for example, uh, our Lord's uh, commandment to, uh, to uh, forgive eh, from the bottom of our heart, well, is a very serious thing. It's a very uh, demanding act of charity eh, in which uh, the charity and the love of God comes to us um, uh, I've often been interested in and fascinated by uh, a particular text of, um, of St. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5.16, the Sermon on the Mount, where our Lord says, uh, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And it is a fascinating text. It is a very powerful text that when we do things, we do things in such a way that people don't think about us, don't congratulate us, but rather they uh, give thanks to God, huh? give glory to God. Isn't it interesting in the Gospels that when Jesus does marvelous things and works miracles, uh, the, the, the uh, people who are watching him and listening to him, they give glory to God, huh? give glory to God. Huh? Uh, and that is the, 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 the purpose of, our, uh, of the life of charity. It isn't, it isn't to attract attention to ourselves. That would be a waste of time. Why would we do that? Why, why should we do that? So charity is so, in some ways sort of a, a, a mobile thing uh, uh, by which uh, the power and the grace of God is present among other people. And people start asking themselves, you know, I, I, I like charity. I'm, I'm moved by this person's charity, but I'm not able to do that. Uh, where does that person get the capacity to love me in a generous way? Where do they get it? Huh? And that's obviously what gets the mind going and thinking and thinking, well, there must be somebody from whom they receive that power, huh? a divine reality from whom they receive that power. When you see a person who's uh, unfailingly kind and the spirit of service and always looking after people and that sort of thing, you say, well, how did they manage to keep doing that? Huh? How did they manage to persevere in that? So the idea of uh, that uh, we live, and I think is the core element of the, of the homily of our Father, the idea that we are not just Alka Christus, but Ipse Christus, Christ himself, eh? Christ himself. Um, there are a few other expressions in his writings, in our Father's writing, also in this homily, but in, in, in other writings, where he basically says the same thing even though in different words. I'll just mention three, eh? and that'll be enough. I'll leave it at that. Eh? The first one is the expression, bonus or Christi, 2 Corinthians 2.15. Um, he says, every Christian should, be, should make Christ present among men. That's what we've been seeing in this, uh, in this homily. He ought to act in such a way that those who know his sen this sense, in this, who know, it, this sense, the fragrance of Christ. Men should be able to recognize the master in his disciples. It's where our father says, our hearts fixed on God, then our words, our actions, our defects will give, um, for, um, will give forth the bonus order Christi, the sweet fragrance of Christ, which others will inevitably notice and say, here is a Christian. So there's an interesting area there. 
And our father refers that, for example, just by way of example, he refers it to chastity, to a noble life, and to uh, the charity that sows understanding and friendship. Second point, the second area by which our father mentions the same idea and develops the same uh, notion, even though he doesn't make a direct connection, but it's very closely connected, is the doctrine of the compelle entrare, no? Uh, the doctrine of uh, Luke's gospel, which speaks of the, 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 the people in the, uh, uh, who are brought into the wedding feast by the scruff of their neck, you know, whether you like it or not. Um, so, um, and you could look at that and say, well, look, is this not uh, an invitation to violence, to coercion, uh, physical or moral, uh, one kind or another? And our father says no. And in a very early text of his, from 1942, he has the following to say, which describes the compelli entrare. He says, it's not a kind of material push, but rather the abundance of light, of doctrine, the spiritual stimulus of your prayer and your work, which is an authentic witness to doctrine, the sum total of the sacrifices which you know how to offer, the smile coming to your lips because you are children of God filiation which fills you with a serene happiness though adversities may also be there which others see and envy add to all this your human grace and qualities and we have the content of the compelle intrare in other words it's a it's a the, the life of god within us which communicates that power to other people and then the last point i'd mention just very quickly is um, the, uh, the, the motto that our father had and he used and he applied it on many occasions to his own life, to hide and to disappear is for me so that only Jesus, so that Jesus alone may shine out. That's a very beautiful way of putting things. Our father worked very hard and he tried very hard to, to, to bring uh, the things of the work ahead. Uh, but at the same time, he, he, he did all he could not to attract attention to himself because he wasn't interested in that. Eh? He wasn't interested. He wanted people to go to the Lord and he didn't want people to be sort of just following him. No? Uh, he used to say, <laughs> ver el bicho, no? to see just this particular kind of animal. What's it like or what's he like? Our father didn't want that. Eh? He saw himself as as an envelope which you throw out after you've taken the letter you're not going to hold on to the envelope and our father saw himself in that way and in that way you could say he lived his life uh, as uh, ipsi christus alter christus uh, he lived his life uh, full of the bonus all christi and um, drawing many people along to uh, to the lord and i think that's something we we could learn from him on a uh, the, on this occasion, I mean, uh, it's nearly 50 years since our father left us, but his message is still alive and still very powerful, still very applicable to all we're doing, to all we're living in the midst of. So thank you very much for listening. That's all I have to say this evening. Well, thank you very much, Father Paul, for a very interesting and informative lecture. I'll just say that there will be a link to the video uh, posted on our website whenever we have it available. We do a little bit of editing and uh, we post it as soon as possible and uh, up on our website. Mm -hmm. I just might mention this point that this evening's presentation, which was most interesting, comes just after a series of three online theological sessions on the church in the mm -hmm. parish, which finished last Thursday. And if you missed any of them, uh, the recordings are available on the parish website. And it is planned to organize other presentations of this type of general theological interest via webcam from the parish, also on Zoom uh, when appropriate. And uh, we're looking forward to the time when we can have people physically present at these lectures. Father Paul, just one question that struck me. Uh, Christ is alive and acting, but the world seems to be becoming more and more materialistic and even anti-Christian in his attitude. And for some people, this is a challenge to their faith. Would you have any advice you'd like to give to people just who are under pressure because of the um, environmental anti-Christianism, anti-Christianity anti that they're experiencing? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose that's the issue that's there. No, that's the thing that we all sort of think about and we're sort of concerned about. Um, 
I mean, it's easy to say sort of glib things about what you've just mentioned, just a sort of uh, uh, sort of commonplace uh, to make commonplace observations. No? Um, and I think the point I mentioned earlier on, the, the text of uh, St. Jose Maria, is that, well, the world will come and go, things are going in this way and that way and the other way. But at the same time, from the point of view of, uh, of our faith, God is God and humans are humans. So in a certain sense, not that uh, the things haven't fundamentally uh, changed, the same basic coordinates are there. No? Now, one thing I think we should keep in mind is that um, when society, any, any society, any country is all sort of all Christian. I mean, Ireland has been like that in many ways, even though obviously even in the past as well, of course, there are plenty of gaps in our, in our Christian awareness and our Christian faith. No? But, uh, but in, I mean, Ireland was a, a very Christian country. But of course, with that, you kind of get used to, you get used to being Christian and you just take it for granted that you are Christian and you have to be Christian and it's just part of your identity and in a certain sense you stop thinking about it and you stop making it your own. Now one of the things I think that we've all been moved to or we've all been stimulated by in recent years when we see the decline, the tangible decline of Christian life uh, among many people is that we have had to in some ways uh, go back to basics of our faith eh? and to really sort of get things going at a deeper level in our own personal lives because we can't just sort of take things for granted anymore we just have to make them happen now i would say in a certain sense that's the best possible thing for us to happen uh, uh, the, the best thing to happen for us eh? i think is the best thing um, somebody was asking me last week a uh, bishop in the vatican he was asking me um, you know what, what happened to um to ireland and what happened to the church in ireland and all that sort of thing and I was, I said back to him, I sort of said, well, you know, think about your own country. Things aren't great there either. No. And, uh, and I said one thing, which I think is interesting, that the number of children born to uh, uh, every woman uh, in, in Ireland is higher than in most countries in Europe. Right? It's one of the highest in most countries in Europe. And that for me is very, is not, is significant. I mean, it's decreasing, but it's, it's significant. Right? It's significant. Um, and, but one of the things that uh, he mentioned was that uh, I think he said that this has been a time of humiliation for the church in Ireland. Uh, and therefore, it's been a time of humility for uh, Christians in Ireland. And humility is the only thing that the devil doesn't want, eh? humility, because humility means openness to God's grace and openness to the power of God. And when people start being humble, that's when you have to get worried. That's when they are anti-Christian. The other thing we should just keep in mind is that as human beings, we should recognize that, our, that we have a fallen nature, uh, even though we've been graced with uh, baptism, but we have a fallen nature, we're born sinners, and therefore our inclination will tend to be downwards, will tend to uh, go downwards. And therefore we are invited uh, personally in some ways to take on our lives and to try to uh, bring things back uh, into a, a, a sort of a, a growth situation. So I would say the circumstances that we're in are a clear invitation to us to, well, to live our Christian life, uh, to live our Christian life in a better way, and then to see what we can do, I suppose, with a, in a creative spirit in a creative way to say well how can i bring my faith to other people and is it possible for people to actually see the faith uh, that i'm living now sometimes we, we we do our level best with people and we get the impression that we're wasting our sweetness on the desert there we're not getting very far very fast but even still there's a very important idea that comes up in the Psalms, which is the idea of sowing the seed. You know? And you remember the Psalm, which says, you know, you go out sowing the seed and uh, the, 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 it just sort of falls to the ground and, uh, you know, full of tears. You know? And then the months go by and nothing happens. And then after months and months and months after sowing, well, then the, the, the plant begins to grow out of the ground again. You know? So I think one of the things we have to learn is the, 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 not only the virtue of humility, but the marvelous virtue of patience, eh? of just sowing abundantly and
and generously and joyfully and serenely without getting upset about things. No? And I think people should be able to see in our words and in our attitudes that we don't lose our peace, we don't lose our calm, that we have something to live for. No? Now, anyway, I think I'm kind of getting into a, a sort of a homily uh, mode here. Um, and uh, um, Are you doing very well? Very leave interesting. It, uh, leave it at that, yeah. Just one other question. Uh, you're living in Rome and you're very close to the Pells of Obstay, to the Father. I'm just wondering, is there anything particular that he's saying or suggesting at the moment that we focus on? Um, well, I mean, he keeps saying, he keeps speaking, and it's a leitmotif that comes up again and again in, his, uh, in the words that he says in every opportunity he has, which is our union with Christ. No? That's why partly I, I wanted to speak about this, uh, this particular homily of our father, because he really has been concentrating on that. And as you're saying, we have to keep looking at the life of our Lord, at his words, at his virtues, at his ways of doing things and try to <laughs> imitate him. Imitate, uh, him as well as uh, we possibly can, no? because that's the, that's the way ahead. No? Uh, just this morning, we had a meditation with him, and the main... Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a buzzer? Is that mine, or is it yours? No, uh, it's my phone, in fact. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting um, WhatsApps in. <laughs> um, and um, the, uh, the, the topic he was speaking about was fidelity. So it was uh, fidelity. No? And I think it's a little bit what I was saying before, which is, uh, that uh, what, the Lord, what the Lord needs, I suppose, from us is that we are faithful to him. Christ and faith, I suppose you could say, the power of God and our fidelity. No? Now, of course, our fidelity isn't just, as it were, fidelity uh, to what Christ says or what the teaching of the church is. That's a very important part, an essential part of it. But it's also fidelity to, I suppose, uh, the people we have around us, no? And the people we have around us who are in difficult situations and just uh, find it very difficult to get out of those particular situations. I mean, I, I think we all know what it is to sort of to be accompany some, accompanying somebody who isn't really uh, prepared to change their, their lifestyle. And we sort of say, you know, uh, you know, I'm fed up with this fellow. I'm fed up with this girl. I just, I just don't want to know anything more about them. I've done my best. I think that's a phrase we have to we have to throw into the waste paper basket. I've done my best because I think we haven't, and I think we can kind of convince ourselves that we have, but we haven't. And that's why when people see that we persevere in our understanding of them, in our affection for them, in spite of their weaknesses and sins, which we don't agree with, whatever. But if we look after them as people, people will see. This person loves me in spite of my misbehavior. Now, that is a marvelous moment of conversion when the Lord decides to uh, rain down his grace on uh, that soul. Uh, the, the, you might say the point of contact with the soul will have been established by that loyal friendship, uh, fr uh, fraternity, maternity, whatever it is. No? Um, so, mm. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Father Paul, for all uh, you've given us this evening. And it's really been very enlightening. And I look forward to, in fact, looking back over it uh, on the video and reading that homily that, just, uh, that you mentioned from Crisis Passing By. So you've really opened our, broadened our horizons and whetted our appetite to dip into St. Josemaria's teachings. And it's so yeah. appropriate on this uh, feast day today. Sure. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay. And, uh, Buona festa. Buona festa. Thanks for listening to me. Okay. okay. It's a pleasure. Right, so. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now. Thank yeah. you.